There is a man and a woman, a married couple in their 80s. They're watching television one night. A commercial comes on and the wife says to her husband, would you go out in the kitchen and get me some ice cream? Sure, he says, and then she says, make sure it's vanilla. Write it down, you're gonna forget it. <laughs> no, 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 he says, I can remember that. And then she says, put some chocolate syrup on it. You're gonna forget it, you better write it down. He says, no, oh, I can remember that. And then she says, put some chopped nuts on top and a cherry and whipped cream. You better write it down because you're gonna forget it. No, no, I can remember that. He comes back 20 minutes later and has a plate of bacon and eggs. She looks at him and she says, you forgot the toast. <laughs> all right, now I'm going to give you all a tip here. If you get called to do a guest sermon, choose memory. It's the easiest thing in the world to talk about because memory is, is really who we are. And we can laugh about it and we can cry about it. In my original draft for this message, I had, at this point, included a short story about Stan Makita. He was a, uh, a player for the Blackhawks, Chicago Blackhawks, uh, Black a uh, Hockey Hall of Famer, and he had, he's been battling Alzheimer's. Uh, but I decided to leave it out because I think a lot of us already know that story. We all know that memory can be the best and it can be the worst thing about being a human being. A few months ago, I started this little journey to learn about human memory. It began with a movie called The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. The title is actually drawn from some lines in a poem by Alexander Pope. He wrote it in 1717, and it's called El Eloisa to Abelard. Uh, the poem and the movie are both about the heartbreak of love. Joel, the main character in the movie, uh, he's played by Jim Carrey. He's stunned to find out that Clementine, who's played by Kate Winslet, has had all these, had her memories uh, of their relationship erased by a radical medical procedure. And he decides that the only solution for his heartbreak is to undergo the same treatment. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for some of us? If it was only that easy? In the movies, it is. In life, it isn't. We may want to clean out the bad memories, but we also want to hold onto the good ones. And there are several ways we do that. For instance, I'm willing to bet you that most of you here have strong links between your olfactory senses and your memories. Whenever I smell tomato plants, the leaves of the plants, I immediately think of my grandmother. I lived with her for a few years in my early 20s, and I always remember how we grew a small garden together. The tomato plants were our, our special pride. The other smell that always comes to mind is patchouli. It reminds me of the 60s. <laughs> if I smell it, I feel like I'm back in high school, and I feel young again, even if, if, even if I know it's my nose having a, an hallucination. So. <laughs> I have another way of holding on to memories. If you have seen Inside Out, how many of you have seen it? Wonderful movie. Don't miss it. Riley has her marbles, these, these little translucent globes that hold episodes in her life. Uh, I have what I call a treasure trove, and I'm going to talk about three pieces from my treasure trove. This is a jar of instant Winfield right here. Uh, every year I would go out to this uh, music uh, festival in Winfield, Kansas, and I don't like to talk about this very much, but in 1980, I, I came in second in the National Finger Picking Championship, and I, I won this guitar here. That, that was pretty nice. But this is how I remember the trip, because when you're out in Kansas, there's a lot of dirt blowing around. So this is, this is how I remember that, that trip. This is, uh, we have a tradition in this church of bringing water back home after our summer travels. And, I always keep my water bottles. When people come into my place, they say, what are all these water bottles doing here? And I say, these are my summers. And this is the summer of 2008. This was a good one. I played at the Winnipeg Folk Fest. I went up to Taos, New Mexico. I went to Cooperstown, Saratoga. 
That was a good summer. Now here's my favorite. Some of you know I played music with a guy named Peter Ostrusko from time to time, and I remember we took a trip one year out to Arkansas, and he gave this to me as a Christmas present. It's a yodeling dill pickle. So all you visitors, when you go home today, you can say, I went to this church today, and this guy was doing a sermon, and he worked a yodeling dill pickle into it. It's it's great. So anyway, these are some of my uh, pieces of my treasure trove, but um, the trash is a different matter. This is where we put the memories that we want to forget. Someone told me about a restaurant. I went to eat there, and the food was terrible. Facebook political argument. (laughs) Duke 68, Wisconsin 63. (laughs) And that's the relationship that went bad right there. The problem with the trash is you can't really get rid of it. It might degenerate, but it doesn't really vanish completely. And inside out, these uh, memories are represented by the memory dump, a deep abyss that's covered in dark marbles. Uh, They appear to be dead, but the fact is they're still there, and they can spring uh, spring back to consciousness if the conditions are right. So I continue on with this little search about memory, and I, oh, good grief, please put that away. So I, I was wondering if there was anybody out there that can't forget anything. And sure enough, I found out about a woman named Jill Price. She's the first person to ever be diagnosed with hyperthymestic syndrome. I hope I pronounced that correctly. In short, she has a continuous automatic recall of every day of her life since she was about the age of 14. Her story is it's fascinating and frightening. She, she cannot stop the flood of accumulating memories, and it becomes an, an unbearable burden for her. The way the story goes, the doctors are helpful insofar as helping her understand the nature of her condition, but there's really no way to make it stop. She discovers a form of catharsis in keeping incredibly detailed journals. At last count, in this book, she had 50,000 pages, and every page was teensy-weensy handwriting. The other thing she did was she accumulated a huge amount of knickknacks, big enough to fill up several rooms in a large house. As she starts to research uh, memory, she comes across a book entitled The Seven Sins of Memory, written by a man named Daniel Schachter. And in the book, he he describes these seven primary mechanisms that the human mind employs to uh, distort reality. Three of them are uh, called sins of omission. Basically, they are uh, being forgetful, uh, having a breakdown between attention and memory, things like that. Four of them are what he calls sins of commission, where something actually interferes, uh, something external actually interferes and, and distorts the memory. I don't want to go through all these with you because this is supposed to be a sermon, not a not a, uh, a psychology class, but this is, uh, the one that intrigues me the most is, it's called persistence. Persistence is really the core of the message that I'm uh, giving this morning. It's the sin of memory that I find the most vexing, simply because it won't leave us alone. It haunts us, and it causes incalculable amounts of pain. I would guess here that most everyone has memories that they would love to make disappear, but they just won't go away. I was thinking about, I know it's a very small version, but this is the famous Salvador Dali painting. You know what this is called? The Persistence of Memory, right? Okay, now, I started looking at it, and and it occurred to me, maybe it's called the Persistence of Memory because time is melting, but it's still sticking around. It's not going anywhere, you know? So, um, 
I think there are some memories that we do want to hold on to for keeps. That's a, that's a kind of persistence, too, that give our lives shape and, and meaning. But persistence as a sin is quite different. Jill Price's memories make her life incredibly difficult. Joel's memories break his heart. Riley's memories make her sad and longing for home. But deeply held memories can lead to much, much worse things. So in my research, I came across a reference to a book called November 9th, How World War I Led to the Holocaust. And there's an author named Joachim Riker. He wrote this book, and he says, the core of, his, of Hitler's hatred lies in the defeat of Germany in World War I, where he blamed the Jews for the, 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 the defeat of the country and the collapse of the monarchy and the ruination of millions. He saw that the state poisoned. He saw the state as poisoning from within. He lived in Munich, where the Jews played a leading role in the revolution uh, uh, against the monarchy on November 9, 1918. So in his mind, the Jews were the reason for the inner poisoning of Germany, and they were the ones that stole victory from Germany. There was also a theory that uh, Hitler's mother, Clara, uh, had breast cancer and sh she was unsuccessfully uh, uh, treated by a, a Jewish doctor and he always blamed the doctor uh, for, for her death. But whatever happened in his memories, as twisted as they were, one thing is for sure. We all know what that led to. So a persistence of memory can contribute to a, a perpetuating hatred and retribution. But I believe there's something stronger. And I believe that is the human ability to say that this train of hatred stops here. It acknowledges that one may not be able to forget, but one can decide to forgive. It lives in the words of Nadine Collier. Her mother, Ethel Lance, was murdered by uh, Dylan Roof. She said, you took something very precious away from me, but I forgive you. Some of you might remember in 2001, two members of our church lost their only son after the plane he was on hit the first tower on 9-11. And I remember this. At the memorial service, his mother stood in this pulpit and said that she prayed for the mothers of those 19 hijackers. It was an astonishing moment, one that I will never forget. Would I be that forgiving? Would you? Just think about it. Just remember, that's who we are. We're going to ask you to stand as you're able. And we have congregational response number 299, make channels for the streams. <laughs> 